A few years ago, I became a mother through adoption. And I'll just tell you right now, I was totally unprepared. Not in that, oh, everybody's unprepared, you don't know what to expect kind of way. I mean, I was legitimately unprepared. My home study finished, a week later I was matched, and 11 days later my child was born. 11 days. You might think that I would spend that precious tiny nesting window actually nesting, and I can see why any reasonable person would think that, but that's not what I did. What I did is I took all of the unopened baby goodies my friends gave me, put them in a bedroom, shut the door, and listened to Tom Petty tell me over and over again that waiting is the hardest part. <laughs> so when the call came at 3 o'clock in the morning to get on the road because my son was being born, I just threw unopened baby goodies into the car and got on the road. So it was a few days before I got a chance to take serious inventory of what I had packed. And it turns out that what I had packed were a couple of bottles, a small pack of diapers, a baby swing, and three, yes, three tubes of diaper rash ointment. <laughs> so apparently my first 3 a.m. parenting decision was that my child might not have food or clothes, but he was going to have the most comfortable baby bum in the history of baby bums. <laughs> But there was one thing that I was absolutely prepared for, children's books. As an ethicist, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how we transmit educational advantages and disadvantages onto our children. And of course, one of those ways is through children's books, reading bedtime stories to kids, having books in the house, exposing them to a wide range of vocabulary, modeling reading as the sort of thing you do for fun. So even before I became a mother, I'd spent kind of a weird amount of time thinking about the relationship between parents children and their books. But also, as a person, I have always loved children's books. Always. You know how you have that one that just sticks with you for a long time? For me, it was Love You Forever. You know, the one where the mother says, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be. And she sings it to her son up through his adulthood until he sings it to her in her old age. I loved this book. I loved it so much that when I was 22, my mother gave it to me for Christmas. Um, <laughs> Though at 22, the image of the mother driving through the street in the middle of the night with a ladder strapped to her car to climb into her adult son, his bedroom window, that was unsettling rather than charming <laughs> or heartwarming. And it's not just that one. The little girl from my goodnight book is frozen in my brain the way that other people have the copper tone baby frozen in theirs. You know, the little girl with the dogs pulling off her swimsuit, which is also, as an adult, unsettling. <laughs> So I was ready for children's books. I read blogs, I shopped in stores. I, I cannot tell you how much I love them. If it were up to me, Dragon's Love Tacos would have won a Pulitzer by now. So at almost three, my son has loads of children's books. He's got multiple bookshelves. They're spread out throughout our house. He keeps books in his diaper bag in the car. He even keeps books in the kitchen cabinet where I store my crock pot. We love children's books. And as much as I have loved sharing these books with him, Purchasing children's books has become frustrating and sometimes even heartbreaking and a reminder of how afraid I am about the world that's waiting for my son. And that's because my son is black. And most characters in children's books are not. Now, I thought that I was imagining this, but it turns out I'm really not. So according to the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the University of Wisconsin, in 2015, of the 3,200 children's books that United States publishers sent them, fewer than 300 were about a character that looked like my son. Right? Uh, fewer than 30 were about Native Americans. Uh, just over 100 about Asian Pacifics and fewer than 100 about Latinos. If you're doing the math along with me, you'll see that that means only about 16% of the children's books published that year were about a person of color. Now, you might be thinking one of two things right now. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, that's shocking. I had no idea. How do I fix it? And if that's where you are, perfect. Stay tuned. I'm coming back for you later. But you might also be thinking, wait, wait, but so many children's books aren't even about people. They're about animals or plants or robots or whatever. Apparently, this response was so common that in 2013, Kathleen Horning, who's the director of the Cooperative Children's Book Center, started separating the books out. She started separating out books about humans from books about r animals or plants or whatever. And when she wrote her report halfway through the year, she said that what she found is books about humans, it's still the case that people of color make up only 15% of those books. 
Uh, so when you add back in all the other children's books, only 7.8% of them were about a person of color. Think about what this means for a minute. It means that in 2013, the same year in which my son was born, over 90% of the children's books published were about a character who did not look like him. So, okay, if you're writing a book about a, ch uh, about a person, uh, that person is probably going to be white. White is the default. So much so that when Lost My Name created customizable books for any child, they in fact created only two levels of customization, name and gender. When I asked about this, I received an email saying that the product had reached a wider market than they had initially anticipated and that their future products would show their diverse readership and their commitment to inclusive storytelling. And I should say they've done it. Now you can customize by skin color as well. But think about what their response to me means. It means that the initial market they had in mind was made up of white children. And there's nothing surprising about that. White is the default. You can see this everywhere. In 2014, when Annie was re-released with Quoven Jane Wallace in the title role, Vulture magazine panned the movie on the grounds that, quote, the black angle was neutered. According to the review, the movie was a giant missed opportunity because it failed to offer an African-American slant on the story. But think for a second about what that review means. It means that the movie's failure was that it never told us why Annie was black. And tragically, audiences weren't yet ready to see a person of color have the same sorts of adventures that they'd seen white people have, at least with, without asking why it wasn't a white person having this adventure as well. Of course, if it is a white person having the adventure, we don't ask that question. We don't ask why is it a white person rather than a person of color. We just don't talk about race. The place you see this, I think, most clearly in children's books is in a series called Ordinary People Change the World. Um, I would probably never have noticed this series, but every time I'm somewhere children's books are sold, I peruse. And I was perusing. And I found this. I am Jackie Robinson. And even though we have many books in our house about Jackie Robinson, and they're excellent, I reached to purchase this one because I try to vote with my dollars, right? This is what we do as consumers. When we buy something, we vote yes to this sort of thing. And I absolutely want to vote yes to children's books about people who look like my son. So I reached to purchase I Am Jackie Robinson, but I had to stop. And it was the book next to it from the same series that stopped me. Because from this one series, Ordinary People Change the World, I was standing in a store looking at a copy of I Am Jackie Robinson next to a copy of I Am Albert Einstein. Please do not misunderstand me. Both of these people absolutely deserve to be celebrated. I have no problem with books celebrating Jackie Robinson and or Albert Einstein, but in that moment, in that store, what I was looking at was the subtle, and I am sure, unintentional message that one person changed the world through sports and another who was just a genius. The genius just happened to be the white guy. So, okay, I went home and I went straight to the series website just hoping against hope that this was just an unfortunate pairing. That surely when I looked at the series website, I would find a black intellectual and a white athlete and I would promptly order the entire series and immediately commence a joyful dance of gratitude. But as it turns out, in addition to Jackie Robinson and Albert Einstein, the other people this series says have changed the world are Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., Abraham Lincoln, Amelia Earhart, Lucille Ball, and Helen Keller. Again, all absolutely deserve to be celebrated, but think about the message that's sent. The range of ways in which white Americans have changed the world has been academia, flight, activism, comedy, and the presidency. And the range for black people was civil rights and sometimes sports. And we already think it matters who children see and who they don't see. I want my child to see the, bo the book about Duke Ellington or Mae Jemison or Neil deGrasse Tyson, Richard Pryor. The books are out there, they're just much harder to find. Because usually, if we tell a story about a person of color, 
the story is actually about the person's color. And the person becomes a mere vessel for that bigger story. So, but look, we do think it matters who, people, who children see, right? The reason that the Lego female scientist set was so celebrated was because of a widespread recognition that both girls and boys should see science as something that girls do too. It matters who you see and what they're doing when you see them. And literature can help here. Recent research has found that reading the Harry Potter series can help instill favorable attitudes about immigrants, refugees, and homosexuals, despite none of those groups appearing in the books. The theory is basically this. Look, we always knew that if you know somebody who's different from you, that can change your view of those differences. And it turns out if you know someone who knows someone who's different from you, that can change your view of those differences. But now, it looks like if you read about someone who knows someone who's different from you, that can change your view of those differences. And I, I want to be clear, this is a series that could stand a fair bit more diversity. And there's a meaningful sense in which this is one more opportunity for white children to see themselves as the heroes. But what those kids do is they talk to creatures who are nothing like them. And it turns out that children, even very young children, are capable of internalizing the message that differences don't have to be threatening. And this shouldn't surprise us that much. The reason we think it's good to read to children in the first place is because it helps develop their imagination. Children of color deserve to imagine themselves having the same range of ordinary and extraordinary experiences that white children get to imagine themselves having 90% of the time. White children deserve to see children of color having those experiences. Children do not deserve the stereotypes that we hand down to them. They deserve to start fresh, and they're in the best position to start fresh, they're kids. So, okay, we have a problem. Most children's literature is about a white character, and when children's literature is about a person of color, it's usually about the color rather than the person. As much as I find this problem just awful, I think the solution, or at least part of it, is awesome. It's magical, in fact. Because at least part of the solution is going to be to buy more children's books. <laughs> so for me, this is like Christmas. There's a serious problem, both for me personally and for us as a society. And browsing and purchasing children's books constitutes genuine work toward addressing the problem. I, that's just incredible to me. And by the way, it should be incredible for you even if you don't need children's books because it's not just children's books where this happens. It's movies, it's televisions, it's video games, it's greeting cards, it's anything sold in a market where white is the default. So we can all get on board with helping this. And the best part is that I'm not arguing that you spend more money. So unlike lots of arguments about the ethical consumer, I'm not saying buy this thing, it costs a little more, but ethically it's better. I'm saying you're gonna spend money on movies and television and books and things. You can either spend that money in a way that reinforces these really troubling stereotypes, in a way that continues to make certain worlds much more easily accessible to white people than to people of color, or you can spend that money the same money addressing one of our most morally urgent social problems today. You can even blame me, if you need to, for all the stuff you're gonna buy that you wouldn't have even known was out there if you hadn't been looking. And at least when it comes to children's literature, there is great stuff out there. The dot-ish. Happy birthday, Madame Chapeau. Please, baby, please. Elevator magic, listen. <laughs> if you know a child who likes elevators, and you hope that someday that child will also like math, you cannot beat elevator magic. <laughs> I wouldn't have been looking for these if not for my son. Because most of us don't notice who's not there right? until somebody comes and gives a TEDx talk or one of these websites tells you, we have a problem, here's how you can help. Before I saw the face that just owned my heart, that I wanted to see all the time, everywhere. 
I hadn't noticed all the times I didn't see him. It's a little like the arrow in the FedEx logo. You don't notice it until someone points it out to you, but then once they do, that's all you can see. We've got to start seeing who's not there. It's not just people of color. Children's literature should reflect a diversity of religions and family structures, mental and physical abilities, just to name a few. This is what we've got to start doing. We've got to start seeing who's not there, whose adventures are missing. We have to vote with our dollars. We have to demand that we see stories about people who don't look like us that they get to have the same ordinary and extraordinary adventures. And we've got to demand they take us along for the ride. Please, my child deserves a world that sees him more than 8% of the time. Thank you. <laughs>